So uh, today's, uh, today's session, so um, in our workshop, condensed matter solitons. So uh, today's first speaker is Professor Yong Bae Kim. So let me briefly introduce him. Although probably we don't need any introduction. <laughs> so uh, he, <clears throat> he received his uh, uh, bachelor's degree from Seoul National University and master's degree from uh, post-tech and PhD degree from MIT. In 1995. After that, uh, he worked as a postdoc uh, at Bell, Bell Lab. And then after that, uh, he joined, uh, he, 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 was the, he was the assistant professor at the Penn, uh, Penn State and subsequently at the Ohio State University. And after that, he became associate professor at the University of Toronto. Um, and then uh, uh, ever since uh, he, uh, he has been at the University of Toronto, and currently he is a director uh, of a center for quantum materials at the University of Toronto. And he's a uh, leading expert on uh, novel phases of quant uh, quantum materials, including uh, quantum magnets, uh, topological materials, and so on and so forth. So we are very happy to have him as, a, as an invited speaker. So let's welcome him with a big, uh, big applause. Um, thank you very much. So I'm going to share uh, my slide. So first of all, uh, uh, um, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to this interesting online workshop. Um, so uh, the topic I'd like to discuss today is like how to detect uh, some novel excitations in um, quantum spin liquid and related phases, especially I'm going to uh, talk about uh, novel excitations in Kitai magnet. So you may have heard about Kitai uh, spin liquid. So there have been a lot of uh, theoretical and experimental uh, effort trying to identify spin liquid phases in this, this, this kind of material. So collectively we call them um, Kitai magnets. So uh, first I'd like to uh, give a very brief introduction to uh, topological order and fractionalized equitation just to uh, set up the stage. Then hopefully I can talk about two different topics. The first topic is about uh, uh, how to detect uh, sharp signatures of um, a fractionalized equitation, something like a spin-on, for example, a bison in quantum spin locate. Um, and I'd like to propose that uh, um, there's something called two-dimensional coherent nonlinear spectroscopy. So this is kind of optical tool, uh, but I will um, explain how this kind of tool can be used to detect uh, sharp signatures of um, fractionalized particle uh, using the example of guitar spin liquid. And the next topic is about thermal hole conductivity. This is a uh, very controversial issue. Um, there, have been, there have been some um, very interesting experiments done on material called alpha-lucene chloride three. And uh, we, we believe that uh, the dominant contribution to thermal hole conductivity seen in the experiment may be due to uh, topological magnum. So, so hopefully I can talk about that too. Yeah. So, um, so quantum spin liquid is, uh, we, we usually say, it's a long range quantum entangle uh, topological phases. So uh, what that really means is that the wave function, the ground state wave function of this state cannot be written as a product state of short range uh, entangled blocks. So here is some cartoon picture for uh, the famous uh, radiating valence from the spin liquid. So here uh, each each uh, unit like this represents a spin singlet dimer. So imagine that I have a square lattice and I, then I place uh, various uh, dimer configuration like this in some way like that. But then think about all possible uh, dimer configurations on this lattice. Then I take a linear superposition of that. So if I take um, such a linear superposition, uh, then um, since I'm superposing every possible diagram configuration, I can restore a transpiration invariance. And also uh, because of the fact that 
individual unit is a diamond, so it's a spin zero object. Uh, so the class of wave function like this um, naturally becomes a spin singlet uh, ground state. So you, you have a spin rotation symmetry uh, in the ground state, and you also have a translational symmetry. So, so now, instead of um, writing this wave function as a superposition of dynamo configuration, we can also use the following uh, straight teach. So imagine that I take uh, one of the dynamo configuration as a reference stage. I think about another dynamo configuration and uh, imagine that I place this configuration on top of that configuration, the reference stage. Then you realize that uh, if I do so, that I end up with a um, um, collection of um, closed loops right there, like this. Um, so what that means is that uh, this wave function, um, you can also think about this, the sum of a loop configuration or the closed loop configuration like that. So sometimes that's the reason why it's called the uh, string uh, configuration or loop configuration. And such a wave function is, is quite complex, obviously. So it turns out that uh, uh, there's no local unitary transformation that would connect wave function like this to a product state of short range integral blocks. So what that means is that if you look at uh, this wave function, for example, uh, if you think about a two site, a single wave function. So obviously uh, these two sites two sites uh, are quantum integral, but uh, globally there's no integral. Basically it's a short range integral wave function then there's a product of that. So, so that's what I mean by product, product state of short range integral blocks. And, and there's, no, there's no local unitary connecting um, in a state like this and um, quantum spin liquid. But in that sense, um, this, kind of, this kind of state is called a long range uh, quantum integral state. Okay, now the question is, you know, quantum entanglement is a very abstract concept. So you know, how to measure this quantum entanglement or the long range quantum entanglement? So if you ask this question to the theorist, you know, people would say, well, you know, you can put the system on some non-trivial manifold with uh, some, some non-trivial number of genuses like spear, torus, uh, genus two, torus, and things like that. And when you count the number of degenerate ground state, then it changes from one manifold to the other. But there's something called modular transformations, if you're familiar with this. And these, um, then there are something called SMT matrices, and those guys can measure, say, non trivial statistics of um, underlying quasi particles. So as people also talk about topological integral entropy, um, typically, uh, ground state of the main body wave function satisfies so-called area law. So for D-dimensional system, the internal entropy usually scales like uh, L to the D minus one. And there's a shift in the internal entropy. This is called um, topological internal entropy. And this gamma knows about uh, so-called, you know, quality particle contact of uh, such a topological state. But these are all theoretical consideration. And this is, this kind of information is completely useless uh, to experimentalists. So experimentalists obviously wouldn't care uh, uh, what theories will talk, what theories will um, uh, talk about to say something like this, right? So can you actually measure this thing? So uh, uh, there have been a lot of uh, proposal as to uh, how to detect non-trivial agitation. So these are sort of a uh, known method. So typically like, uh, you know, if S of Z is conserved, this spin is a good quantum number. So, uh, you know, there are some excitations per spin on, but they only carry a, a, a spin half quantum number, but there's no charge, obviously. And then since these objects carry spin, uh, in principle, they would contribute things like spin susceptibility, uh, NMR relaxation rate, one over T1, and dynamical structure factor. And for dynamical structure factor, you cannot detect spinons individually because uh, the, the neutron scattering or the dynamic structure effect only measures a spin one excitation, like a magnon. So you can only you can only only detect pairs of spinons, 
And as a result, usually the synergy is not so sharp. And there are other non-trivial architectures like a bison. The bison is like a, a defect configuration of um, Eigen gauge field or G2 gauge field. Or you can think of this as a um, soliton, for example. And you, you can also have a U1 gauge field if you have a U1 spin locate. And then the flux color of A uh, that corresponds to this gauge field usually associated with um, uh, the scalar um, clarity uh, of the spin degrees of underlying spin degrees of freedom. So if there is a way to measure uh, scalar clarity or well, scalar clarity fluctuations, then in principle, you could measure uh, the flux degree of freedom of gauge field. And notice that either bisons or uh, U1 gauge field, and these objects don't carry any spin, doesn't carry any uh, uh, charge, it carries entropy. So, so since they carry entropy, it contributes to things like the capacity and uh, thermal conductivity. So people have proposed uh, various experiments that can possibly uh, detect those excitations. But all of these informations are usually very indirect and you don't really have a very sharp signature. Uh, just to give you an example why this is not so easy. Uh, imagine that I like to detect this uh, spin excitation using neutron scattering. And as I said, neutron scattering can only detect spin one excitation. So naturally, the only thing you could possibly detect is spin on and this spin on entire excitation. So you end up with some kind of scattering continuum. So this is the famous uh, neutron scattering experiment done by uh, Martin Muriga. Um, it's a one dimensional uh, Heisenberg spin chain. And as you know, uh, um, the spin half Heisenberg chain uh, is a one dimensional spin liquid. To be honest, this is a one dimensional spin liquid and you have a spin on anti spin excitations. And these blobs basically represent uh, such a spin um, scattering continuum. So first of all, these signatures are not sharp. I mean, you only get some kind of, um, say, you know, smushy uh, continuum. Also, it's, it's much harder to conform this in 2D and 3D. So for example, you know, how can you easily uh, detect a uh, scattering continuum coming from anti-spinon spin -on pair or some um, boring uh, paramagnet? It's not easy, actually. So, we have a, a relatively new proposal uh, to use um, two-dimensional coherent nonlinear spectroscopy. So the idea is somewhat similar to uh, the, the, the two-dimensional uh, NMR experiment. So uh, to explain this, uh, let me introduce um, the, the famous uh, spin half the time model. So this is the model that's exactly solvable. And uh, we know that the ground state is so-called a Z2 spin locator. So I'm sure a lot of you already heard about this, but I'm going to review this very quickly. So this is the model, spin model, interacting spin model defined on the two-dimensional honeycomb line. And, and there are X type, Y type, and G type bond. And for each type of bond, you have an Ising interaction. So for example, for the X bond, you have an SX, so sigma x, sigma x interaction between these two sides. For y bond, you have a sigma y, sigma y. For z bond, you have a sigma z, sigma z interaction. So it's a very simple Hamiltonian. If you try to solve this model classically, then you, you find that uh, the number of um, uh, the, the spin configuration uh, um, that will make a cross the manifold, uh, this actually exponentially large. So it's a highly frustrated system. Quantum mechanically, you uh, have solved this model in the following fashion. So you write spin operator as a product of um, two minor fermion, B minor fermion and C minor fermion. Actually, there are X, Y, Z, uh, three B minor fermion, one C minor fermion. So it is, you know, there are four minor fermion in this representation. So this model can be written like this using this representation, for example. And it turns out that uh, this combination, product of B minor fermion, uh, this object commutes with Hamiltonian. So what that means is that this is a constant motion. Uh, so you can replace this combination 
by uh, some some uh, C number. Um, so you can also define a, a gauge invariant quantity here. So we call it WP. There's a product of um, this spin operator around the hexagon. And you can rewrite it using this combination of UIJ variable like this. It's a product of uh, all this variable around the hexagon. And again, this, this, this operator also committed Hamilton. And uh, you can show that WP square is always one, so WP can only be plus one or minus one. Okay, so these two, these guys are all constant motion. It turns out that the ground state of this model is in the so called zero flux sector. So the ground state WP for every hexagon is plus one. So by the time you fix this, then you can make a gauge choice so that you can set all UIJ equals to plus one. It's a C number. And you have a quadratic Hamiltonian or minor fermion. Then your minor fermion is popping around the uh, only common lattice, then you get a, this familiar uh, band dispersion, uh, the, you know, the dispersion that you're familiar with in the, in the case of in, you know, in analogy to graphing. So you have a Dirac point at the K point, Dirac, uh, Dirac crossing at the K point of the brilliant zone. So this is, so this is a dispersion of the C minor fermion. And that's basically, that's basically a fundamental agitations in the archetype spell maker. So the model is very simple. It's, it can be solved very easily. Okay, now uh, you can ask uh, uh, what does the single spin flip correspond to? So this is something that um, uh, we would create physically. So the one useful way to think about this is define a so-called bond fermion. So B, B's are the minor fermions, remember? And think about an um, operator for two nearby sites, J and K. So, so by making this combination, I can uh, think about, um, I, can, I can define a fermion at each bond. So it's like a J, this, this, this is defined for the um, bond connecting J and K site, okay? So if you define this way, uh, then you can easily convince yourself that this UIJ variable that I talked about can be rewritten in terms of this occupation number of this bond formula. So when, um, when the JK bond is occupied by this bond formula, then this is one, right? So then it's that, you know, two minus one is one. So UIJ will be one. If this bond formula is not occupied, then this corner is minus one. So uh, occupied bond corresponds to like U, J, K to the first one. Empty uh, uh, bond formula will correspond to minus one. So I told you, right, in the ground state, the U, U J, K is, is always plus one. What that means is that in the ground state, every bond is occupied by this bond formula. So that's the way that we can think about the ground state. Now uh, is, is using this bond formula, I can rewrite my spin operator, sigma. I remember that sigma was product of C minor fermion and B minor fermion. And instead of B minor fermion, I can write it as a combination of chi, this bond fermion, annihilation operator, bond fermion, creation operator. This combination just gives you a, a BJ alpha. So it's the same as the original representation. So, what, so using this, um, is, is, is relatively easy to understand um, what actually happens uh, physically. So when you, do, when you have a single spin flip or if you create a spin agitation, you're creating a minor fermion. Then, um, then you have this operator. So remember that in the ground state, every bond is occupied by this fermion. So if you apply a chi dagger, then you know, basically, uh, you, get, you just get null results. So the only this guy will give us a physical answer. So annihilation operator acting on the ground state will tell me that this particular bond uh, is basically empty now. When this particular bond is empty, corresponding UJK is minus one. And everywhere else is plus one, only this guy is minus one. What that means is that now the flux WP is minus one in this block and that block there. In the background of uh, all positive um, 
uh, okay. So the flux, you create a flux excitation. Okay, think of this as a soliton, for example, in, 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 terms of this, in, in this uh, flux configuration. So you, you generate this uh, 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 negative one flux, for example. So, you, so whenever you have a single spin flip, you create a one I thinner minor fermion, then you, you immediately create a two flux degrees of freedom. So that's what actually, actually happens for a single spin flip. Now we can think about what happens uh, for the dynamical spin stock effect. This is something that Newton scaling folks will measure. Um, it turns out that for um, uh, this guitar type spin, okay, the dynamical structure effect looks rather boring. Uh, there's no sharp signatures here. This is the, you know, this, this color scheme is just showing the intensity uh, of the uh, structure factor as a function of momentum uh, and the frequency. And uh, you see that, uh, you know, these are mostly uh, some kind of continuum. Um, the only um, distinct drawing in the signature is that if you look at the, say, SGSG correlator at, at Jones at P equals zero, which is a function of frequency, then you see that um, spin excitation spectrum essentially starts from a two flux gap. So this is the energy gap of creating a two flux. The reason why, um, um, you know, um, you have to supply energy of two flux to, to excite any spin excitation simply because of this, the fact that any spin flip involves the creation of two flux. And then um, there's a finite energy cost for that. That's why uh, you, you, know, you don't get a spin excitation right away. You always have this two flux gap. But other than that, other than that, um, the signature is usually very broad and there's no uh, sharp energy. So just by looking at such a continuum, it's very hard to tell what kind of excitations we have. So now I'd like to introduce um, uh, 2D nonlinear spectroscopy. So here is the idea. So here's the sample. Uh, uh, and, and basically, uh, we, are, I'm, we are going to apply uh, two um, magnetic field uh, pulse. So the first one is at T equal zero. At T equal zero, I have a magnetic field pulse uh, strength is B naught. And we are applying that along the G direction. So G direction uh, for the G uh, spin condensation actually. Yeah. So, and then uh, I would wait uh, the time tau one, and I, then I apply another pulse, uh, magnetic field B1. Then I'm gonna wait for another time tau two. And I, then I measure the magnetization um, of the system. But we are only interested in the nonlinear part of this. So what that means is that uh, I can do this experiment in the following way. So first um, I can measure the magnetization of the system uh, just by applying the first pulse, only B naught. Then I can do another experiment where I apply uh, only the second pulse. In third experiment, I apply both, but with a time delay, tau one. So uh, if M01Z is the, uh, the transient magnetization after applying both pulses, I'm gonna subtract off the response, the system, and there is only P naught. And then I, I also want to uh, subtract off the response of the system when there's only P1 pulse. So what I'm doing here, so I'm basically getting rid of all possible uh, linear response in such a way that um, the resulting magnetization contains only the nonlinear response, basically. Okay. So what that means is that uh, if I'm thinking about a, a nonlinear part of the magnetization, so I just subtract of the linear response part, since it, this is a nonlinear response, um, so I can define a nonlinear susceptibilities. So for example, uh, there's no linear, linear susceptibility. So if I expand magnetization, it's a function of magnetic field, the lowest order will be a second order response. So it's the response function to say B naught and B one. And then the next order is a third order response. Uh, this will be proportional to uh, basically PQ. There are two possible ways to write down a PQ uh, uh, external field configuration. There's a 
P1, P0, P0, or P1, P1, P0. So I'll explain this a little more. But uh, basically, it's a second order nonlinear susceptibility. These are the third order nonlinear susceptibility. And you can go on. And this particular problem, it turns out that uh, measuring third order response function uh, is very important. Okay. So let, now let's look at um, uh, these nonlinear susceptibilities. So the second order nonlinear susceptibility, uh, you can imagine that uh, second order nonlinear susceptibility can be represented as uh, uh, expectation value of this uh, uh, nested commutator. Remember that the linear response is just a commutator between two magnetization variables. Second order susceptibility is a nested commutator, of three uh, magnetization variables. So it's a generalization. Um, since this is a nested uh, uh, commutator, if you, if you expand this, you end up with two kinds of uh, magnetization correlation function. Uh, but notice that uh, it's a product of three magnetization variables. So if you're dealing with a um, universal invariant system, then they just vanish. So if your ground state is time universal invariant, you just don't get second order susceptibility. So the leading order response will be third order susceptibility. Now I have an SDS commutator for four magnetization variables. Okay. So this is the very general expression of the other susceptibility. So the way to read the way to read this response function is like this. So you apply a perturbation or the magnetization pulse, sorry, magnetic field pulse at time t equals zero and time t equals t1. Then next time uh, at time t2 plus t1. So in principle, you can apply three uh, sequential pulse. Then you measure the response at T1 plus T2 plus T3. So that's the meaning of this susceptibility. So generally when people talk about this, uh, uh, we, we, are, we are talking about uh, a pulse sequence at T equals zero. After T time T1, I have another pulse. After time T2, I have another pulse. Then you wait for T3, then I measure the magnetization. So that's basically the protocol. In our case, we, have only, we only have two pulses. What that means is that uh, either T1 is zero. So we apply these two pulses at the same time, then wait another pulse, then wait and measure magnetization, or T2 is zero. So I, this is a pulse and uh, this pulse and that pulse that actually happens at the same time. Um, so that's the reason why uh, the two kinds of uh, susceptibilities with uh, this proportion, you know, this, the coefficient of this kind of uh, a response function. So these are the third order susceptibilities. And notice that uh, in this sequence, uh, in this protocol, your nonlinear susceptibility is function of two time variables, tau one and tau two. Tau one is the time delay. Tau two is related to the measurement time. And that's extremely important. When we usually talk about uh, linear response function, you know, that's just, uh, uh, that's a susceptibility is just a function of only one time. So here I have two, two different times. Um, okay. So let's look at this. So if you really want to compute this, then uh, you have to expand this nested commutator and compute the cor correlator like this. I'm just giving you an example. Then notice that uh, uh, basically time sequence is usually screwed up, right? Because I'm expanding the commutator. So this, I'm just giving you one of the term. There are like four possible terms here. And I'm showing you only one term. And here notice that for this term, uh, the, you know, the operator is not time order. So it's the out of time order correlator, correlation function. So one way to evaluate this is, um, you know, the usual, usual thing, you know, you just insert the resolution of identity. So you, you, uh, you insert all the, uh, intermediate or excited state and ground state. Um, and then, um, then you know, evaluate this Heisenberg operator expectation value that you have this energy uh, uh, variable that shows up in the field of transform. Um, so I told you that uh, in the ground state, G, G is the ground state. The ground state, um, I basically have no flux, okay? Then uh, when you when you have a spin spin operator, a spin flip, 
Uh, then I created two flux and one formula. So this R state or P state can only be two flux and one formula ground state. Now, if you apply uh, another spin split, then it turns out that you know, there are a number of possible um, intermediate states. For example, uh, uh, you could destroy everything so that you end up with a zero flux. Or you can create two flux and no fermions and two flux and one fermions. Yes, I'm not explaining this in gory detail, but just to um, remember that uh, there are various different kinds of uh, flux and fermion configuration. Um, and all of this, uh, all of this excited state can contribute uh, to the nonlinear response function. So in principle, this is a rather complex uh, correlation function with a complex coefficient. So there are a lot of um, uh, very complicated interference effect can actually happen uh, in this correlate. Okay. Having said that, um, if you actually evaluate these kind of correlators for uh, guitar experiment, okay, um, as a function of uh, two time, tau one and tau two, I told you there are two kinds of those are the susceptibilities. Um, you can see that there are some kind of coherent uh, oscillations. Okay. So in the time domain, it looks like this. Uh, it's very hard to figure out what kind of information here. Now, if you do a period transform, uh, then boom, you got some very interesting um, response. So since I'm dealing with a two-time correlator, if I do a period transform, uh, then the resulting period transform is a uh, a function of uh, two frequency, omega one and omega two. Roughly, you can think of omega one as the uh, uh, pump pump uh, frequency, uh, the perturbing frequency. Omega two is a probe frequency. So uh, you can think of this as a, some kind of uh, a pump probe protocol. So, so again, omega one is like you know frequency associated with uh, like a pump. Right? It's basically you're exciting. And excitations and omega two is like uh, frequency related to the actuator the probe that the measurement. Okay, so <clears throat> so there are uh, like six different kinds of correlator. Okay, one can think about and you can do a period transform and you can sum them up. Uh, then the resulting figure looks like that. Okay, so I'm going to explain uh, why this result is interesting. First of all, you see this vertical line. And the, this vertical, the location of the vertical line is precise, it turns out precisely the energy required to create a two flux excitation in the guitar model. Um, this, this line corresponds to uh, energy required to create a four flux excitation. And most interestingly, you see the very sharp uh, diagonal line, in particular, this uh, green line in this quadrant of the response in the, in the frequency space, omega one and omega two space. And I would claim that this is actually the signature of the Mayana formula. And this represents the energy uh, uh, related to Mayana formula excitation. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, so I'm gonna explain why that's the case. Okay, so let's go back to this correlator. So this is what I um, explained to you. So I'm just taking one um, possible intermediate state. Uh, this is the four flux state with the no formula. So let's take that. This is one of the possible uh, excitations. So in principle, I can create a two flux one formula here, two flux one formula here to have a finite metric element. So in general, uh, the energy of this minor formula excitation, they don't have to be the same. EP and the E are uh, the energy of the minor forming excitation. But imagine that um, uh, we choose um, some particular uh, process where energy of this minor forming and that minor forming is exactly the same. Um, so, so then something interesting happens. So, so in this uh, process, uh, if you trust me, uh, if you work out the argument of the exponential function, uh, especially for the tau one variable here, 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 here. Uh, only E p minus E zero survives. So E p is the energy of the p state, intermediate p state. E zero is the ground state. So, so you have this combination. Then, then uh, since this is 
then then um, it actually this becomes a basic delta function. Because if you do the sum, if you uh, do the Peter transform, you can do the same for the tau two variable. You end up with another delta function. If you solve this constraint, and it's especially if you think about a process where this minor fermion, that minor fermion, um, is exactly the same energy, then we end up with this condition. And 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 that's the that's the time when we can satisfy uh, both uh, delta function. So uh, first of all, um, uh, you know you can see that in order to create any uh, excitation, you have to overcome a uh, two flux excitation gap. And secondly, um, if you look at the relation between uh, pump frequency and um, probe frequency, then they are deeper by uh, this four flux minor, four flux uh, excitation energy. And so um, now I can I can. Um, Scan omega one, then I then what that means is that uh, there should be a corresponding omega two all the time. So uh, if I have a, some kind of finite bandwidth for the omega one minor fermion excitation, then there, there should be a corresponding uh, omega two response. So physically, what actually happens is that you start from a ground state, that you excite the uh, two plus one fermion uh, excitation, then you create a four flux and no fermion uh, intermediate state. Then I go back to the two plus one fermion state. Then I go back to the ground state. In this process, I should go back to the exactly the same two plus one fermion state. If I can do that, then what actually happens is that this matrix element becomes a positive definite. So, so there's no, you know, all the interference basically becomes constructive interference. And so in that sense, it's like a, some kind of um, um, echo uh, kind of process in the NMR. We call this uh, minor fermion echo. So for example, this is the place where uh, there are all kinds of constructive interference happens. That condition is precisely this. So that if you think about omega one as the energy of the minor fermion, and this, this response shows up as a sharp excitation like this in the diagonal line, in the diagonal line. So notice that if you can actually detect this, uh, this is really very sharp signature, especially if you scan along this direction. So you definitely get a delta function like behavior. So that's basically the proposal. So uh, uh, yeah, so I think that's uh, basically what, what there is. I think I spent probably too much time on this, but hopefully, hopefully that was clear. So, um, I don't really have a lot of time, but uh, I'm just I'm just going to go through this uh, very quickly. <clears throat> so um, there have been a um, 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 lot of uh, discussions about the thermal hole conductivity uh, into the uh, guitar magnet. So the motivation is that there are some uh, interesting two-dimensional honeycomb uh, magnetic materials where people believe that the time model can be realized. And uh, I'm not gonna go into the details, but because of the strong spin of coupling, either when you have iridium four plus ion or between three plus ion, and they can support some spin of entangled um, uh, so-called effective pseudo spin half degrees of freedom. And using this degree of freedom, one can construct uh, this bond dependent, famous bond dependent Ising interaction. So it is, it is Important that you end up you have this edge sharing octahedra of the surrounding anions. Uh, the real material, especially this alpha lucidium chloride, this is a very famous material. Um, this material uh, actually orders magnetically; it doesn't become a, a spin like it, unfortunately. And the reason for that is there are a lot of uh, other interactions, not just the guitar interaction. And it turns out that other interactions are responsible for the zigzag magnetic order. So, in a way, uh, you, know, you can say this is a disappointment. But uh, people discover that when you um, apply an external magnetic field, especially along so called A direction on the honeycomb plane, you can suppress this magnetic order. So, normally you would think that you, know, you suppress the magnetic order, you will just go to a field polarized state. 
But the neutron scattering uh, folks show that maybe there is some intermediate uh, state before you reach a field polarized state. So in order to prove this, they, they show that in the so-called zigzag magnetic load state, you can see the magnon excitation. The field polarized state, you can also see a paramagnon. But there's a tiny window of magnetic field where they see no magnon and perhaps the only scattering continuum. So this was, there was speculation that perhaps uh, this is in this small window, uh, you may have a uh, field induced spin up there. So that was the speculation. <clears throat> but then there was this uh, surprising experiment uh, where uh, uh, you know, this Japanese group, Kyoto group found that maybe there's a small window magnetic field between magnetic the state and field polarized state. Uh, there is, uh, you know, they measure the thermal hole conductivity and thermal hole conductivity seems to be quantized in the so-called half unit, uh, half, half of the uh, fundamental unit of uh, uh, hole conductivity quantum. So something like this, uh, maybe I'll skip this. Something like this uh, is in principle possible. Um, sorry, in principle possible, uh, if you are, if you are spin liquid, underlying spin liquid, the chiral spin liquid, so that the bulk is gap, but you have a propagating edge mode, and the propagating edge mode is uh, basically myelin fermion edge. Mode. If you do that, then since myelin fermion is only like half of the usual complex fermion, uh, the cop X Y is basically half quantized. So that's basically uh, that that is basically the proposal. Okay. Um, I think I'm going to skip all of that. But point is that um, um, the, the ground state of this material is zero magnetic field. Um, that's not a uh, time spin liquid. So it's very, it's very difficult to imagine why uh, this magnetic order state will become a spin liquid right away when you apply uh, some magnetic field. So we took a um, realistic model realistic model and, and, and investigated like, you know, whether it's possible to induce um, uh, interesting field uh, guitar spin, interesting spin liquid state. Um, so far, um, many of us tried this and none of the semi-realistic model can produce uh, any interesting intermediate state. So we decided that um, we are going to look at other possible origin of this uh, thermal hole conductivity. So that's why we looked at the magnetron contribution. So we took one of the realistic model in the field polarized state. So in the field polarized state, uh, uh, basically there are only two magnetron bands because uh, there are two cycles in itself. Um, so uh, we, we looked at uh, say magnon, magnon bands, for example. So I'm just showing you this dispersion of the magnon bands. Then for each magnon band, uh, we can look at the so-called Berry curvature, also the Chun number. <clears throat> so it turns out that uh, um, uh, the Berry curvature and Chun number uh, is finite. So in that sense, these magnons are topological. So uh, for, for example, for the first band, um, it, depending on whether you apply a magnetic field along a direction or minus a direction, the churn number can be switched. And, and if, if the churn number for the first band is minus one, then churn number for second band is plus one, and so on and so forth. Um, so we can do this by applying a magnetic field along a and minus a direction. Um, if you apply a magnetic field along the b direction, it turns out that the magnon, magnon now become trivial in the sense that the uh, turn number is basically zero. Okay, so using this, uh, we computed thermal hole conductivity um, <clears throat> and we find that indeed uh, along the A and minus that direction, we get a finite contribution, um, but on the other hand for the B direction is basically zero. And this is because of the fact that for the A direction, dispersion is the same, but the very coverage of sign is opposite. But uh, for the B direction, dispersion is uh, symmetric, but very curvature changes sign in such a way that chunk number is zero. And we can show that because of this, 
response is zero here. And uh, for a minus direction, they switch the sign. It turns out that this is precisely what happens in the experiment. Also, uh, uh, it was confirmed that the temperature dependence of the whole response also follows uh, exactly the way that the topological magnetic contribution to kappa xy uh, uh, would exhibit. So uh, this kind of uh, short story. Uh, so yeah, I think I probably uh, ran too fast for the second part, but uh, this is basically what I wanted to say. All right, thank you very much. Yeah, okay, thanks for the nice talk. Uh, now the session is open for questions. Any questions from audience? Uh, Professor Hyung Sun Choi. Hi, uh, thank you for a very interesting talk. So uh, for the from the first part of your talk, yeah. it seems like to get this second or third order susceptibility, you probably need very strong field. <laughs> That's right. So, um, so do I you have a ballpark the number? Technical challenges is, you know, it requires a high intensity. So, so one thing any... I can tell you is that um, so far, uh, um, what has been done for the magnetic magnetic system um, is that uh, uh, there's this person person called the uh, Nelson at MIT. He's in the chemistry department, but he was able to uh, detect this uh, 2 d coherent non spectroscopy for magnon in the magnetic order state. So at least he can detect uh, uh, like some signatures of a uh, two magnon continuum as a sharp excitation. So, you know, the two magnon continuum, usually if you do the neutron scattering, it's just a smooth continuum. There's no sharp signature, but by using this 2D coherent spectroscopy, he was able to see a very sharp signature of that I see. Uh, in the omega one, omega two plane. So at least that experiment can be done, uh, was done. Uh, I have to say uh, there are not many groups who can do this because uh, I was told that uh, the terahertz uh, uh, setup he has, you know, the intensity he can get is probably like seven or eight times stronger than most of the other group. And that's the reason why he said that. <laughs> I don't I don't know the number, but uh, okay. so other groups, uh, you know, uh, uh, they were not able to achieve that. So, for example, so, uh, yeah. for example I actually learned about this. Uh, actually, I learned about this uh, linear spectroscopy from experimentalists. Peter Amitaz at Johns Hopkins University he told me about it. That's the way that I thought about uh, doing this calculation. But he told me that, uh, for example, uh, in, in his current setup, it will be difficult to detect this because mm. uh, this laser doesn't really have uh, enough high intensity. So high who's this person at MIT again? Uh, Keith, Keith Nelson, he's in chemistry. Keith Nelson, I see, thank you. <laughs> it's a terahertz spectroscopist. Okay. Okay, thanks. Uh, maybe one question, one more question. So yep. Yeah. So if there yeah, if there's more questions, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you very much. Thank you.